everyone. If you're new here, this is Ballet Rain. I think that we can agree that if there's one thing that is synonymous with ballet, it would probably be the classic ballet swan lake. And I think also not just for ballet fans, but also for music fans, I think Swan Lake, the Swan Lake theme by Tchaikovsky, I think everybody knows that one. It is definitely one of the most popular and well-loved pieces of classical music. And the thing with Swan Lake is it actually has a very interesting and very little known history that I know as dancers, we don't learn about a whole lot. And no, we just dance it. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of just dance it, but we don't really know the makings of it and the story behind the most iconic piece in all of ballet repertoire. Yeah. So today, we're gonna remedy that, or at least attempt to, and we're gonna share with you some of the history behind this piece, and hopefully you'll learn something that you never knew before about Swan Lake. Before we actually start talking about the Swan Lake that we know and love so much today, we need to talk about what happened before that, which was a man named Julius Reisinger. And he was the one who commissioned a famous Russian composer named Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky to write the music or to compose the music for his upcoming premiere of Swan Lake. Tchaikovsky happily accepted the commission, partly because he needed money and partly because he has long cherished the desire to try his hand at this kind of music. For context, around the turn of the 19th century, the standard for ballet music was very sweet sounding, very light, very easy to listen to music. One that had a very clear rhythm so the dancers could follow and very little to no tension and not very challenging music, if you know what I mean. Nothing that creates strife inside the human soul. Ballets were commonly composed by composers called specialists that were specialized in composing music specifically for ballet. An example of two specialists were Cesare Pugni, don't come for me if I butchered his name, and Ludwig Minkus. Around this time, there came about another technique for writing ballet scores, and that was the leitmotif technique, which involved associating a certain musical motif with a certain character of the story or a certain mood. There are a lot of ballets that we know today that utilize this technique, one of which being Peter and the Wolf by Sergei Prokofiev. Go listen to it, watch the ballet. You'll see the leitmotif technique in action. Each character has a different motif, a different instrument yeah. that voices the character. It's really cool. You should go take a look. Comment below what you think. Tchaikovsky studied many of these ballet specialists, namely Adolf Adam's score for the ballet Giselle and its masterful use of the leitmotif technique. This inspired Tchaikovsky to utilize the same technique in the musical storytelling of Swan Lake. For instance, Tchaikovsky assigned the oboe as the voice of Odette, which you can prominently hear in the iconic theme. Apparently, Tchaikovsky was extremely knowledgeable about every instrument of the orchestra, and he knew that for the oboe, the F-sharp note was the most beautiful note on the instrument, hence why he centered the whole Swan Lake theme around this note. Unlike the standard ballet music of the time, Tchaikovsky's score for Swan Lake was more than just background music for dancers. Instead, Tchaikovsky created a masterful score with such weight and depth that Reisinger and some of the initial dancers of the ballet considered it too complex to dance to. Reisinger's Swan Lake premiered in 1877 with the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow. And believe it or not, it was a disaster. Critics described Reisinger's choreography as unimaginative and unmemorable as well as finding the stage sets, dancers, and orchestra unsatisfactory. Additionally, Tchaikovsky's score was dismissed as too noisy and too symphonic, which left Tchaikovsky devastated. However, in the early 1890s, another choreographer, Marius Petipa, discussed with Tchaikovsky about possibly reviving Swan Lake. But before they could begin the work, Tchaikovsky died in 1893. With permission, Marius Petipa and Lev Ivanov re-choreographed the ballet and Ricardo Drigo revised Tchaikovsky's score. And the new and improved version of Swan Lake made two memorial concerts in Tchaikovsky's honor two years after his death. The ballet was applauded and unanimously well praised, and this is the Swan Lake that we know and love today. Now let's talk about the synopsis of the ballet, the whole storyline, the plot, starting with the prologue. In some companies, they have a story to go with the prologue music. Sometimes it's just 
music with their curtain completely shut. Regardless of what happens on stage, I think it's important that we understand the backstory so that when the curtain does open, we understand what's going on. So the way the prologue goes is we're first introduced to the beautiful princess Odette. She is walking through the forest and she comes across this nice gentleman. All well and good, right? Not. He introduces himself to her very cordially, but Odette is very timid. And he doesn't like that. <laughs> This gentleman does not take well to Odette's rejection, so he follows after her and he reveals his true identity, which is an evil sorcerer, the Baron von Rothbart. Odette is terrified, but before she can do anything more, the evil sorcerer von Rothbart curses her and changes her into a swan. The curse is that she will remain a swan by day and only at night somewhat regain her human form again. This part isn't often portrayed in most productions, but it is part of the story, and that is Odette's mother goes out looking for her daughter, and she searches for her all through the day without finding her, and only finds her at night when Odette is sort of in her mostly human form. Odette explains to her mother the curse and everything that happened to her. Her mother is heartbroken and begins to cry, and she cries an entire lake of tears before finally dying of grief. This lake of tears becomes an enchanted lake, and this is where Odette stays, along with 60 other maidens who have been cursed to live as swans. Act 1, scene 1, of the ballet starts in the palace gardens, where we are introduced to Prince Siegfried, and he's having a birthday. He's just turned 21, so he's come of age, so he and all of his friends and subjects are having fun dancing and celebrating in the palace gardens. Suddenly, the Queen Mother comes in, interrupting the celebrations, to remind Prince Siegfried about the royal ball that they're going to be hosting the following evening, during which he must select a bride from one of six princesses which his mother has arranged for him to meet. As you'd expect, this is a lot of pressure on a 21-year-old boy, and so the festivities kind of come to a halt as Siegfried struggles to grasp the concept of this sudden life change. But to make him feel a little bit better about the arrangement, she motions to her attendants who bring in a beautiful crossbow. She gives it to Siegfried as a birthday gift and also as a reminder of his responsibilities to provide for and protect the kingdom. The celebrations continue on for a little bit longer, then the sun begins to set and everyone begins to go home. Siegfried is left alone in the gardens, surrounded by all of his thoughts, and this is where the pressure of his new responsibilities start to overwhelm him. Suddenly a flock of swans flies overhead, and Siegfried, deciding to put his troubles away for a time for sake of trying out his new crossbow, follows the flock of swans through the forest to the enchanted lake. Now we are in Act 1, Scene 2, which is the lakeside scene, also known as the White Act. It's the classic swan lake scene. The white tutus come out in this act, definitely the most iconic. A huge fog has come over the lake, caused by the evil sorcerer von Rothbart. Rothbart is watching the whole scene from his usual spot on the edge of a cliff overlooking the lake, and as he sees Siegfried approaching, he hides himself to monitor Siegfried inconspicuously. Siegfried reaches the edge of the lake, and he watches the swans land on the water. Suddenly, he sees the most beautiful, pure white swan land on the lake. Siegfried? Possibly out of curiosity, aims to shoot this most beautiful, perfect swan. But before he can, the swan begins to transform into the beautiful princess Odette. As you'd expect, Siegfried is shocked by this sudden turn of events and runs off into the right stage wing. Then Odette emerges from the lake. I think this is where we really get to see that light motif technique that we were talking about earlier. And the musical voice that was given to her throughout this ballet is a single oboe. And the way this solo was written is so beautiful. You can really hear Odette sort of struggling with her dual nature because she's just stopped being a swan and she's not quite a human. So she's in between and she's trying to regain her full human form, but you see that process in there because she does these motifs of a swan, but she's still a human. So she's putting her feathers in order and preening herself the way a swan would, but ultimately she's a human. There's that tension and there's that longing for the actual human form. Mm -hmm. And it's conveyed so beautifully in the music and it really carries the solo. 
Once the prince has recovered from his initial shock, he emerges from the thrushes and starts to approach Odette. And this is where you can see the swan wu teeth coming through. You can see as he's as he's pursuing her, trying to figure out who she is and what on earth she's doing here. Yeah. Kind of like going between swan and princess form. You can see how she's trying to shield herself with her wings, even though she's not really a full swan anymore. But she still has that attitude and that demeanor. And I think her main fear here is that he's still holding on to his crossbow. <laughs> he hasn't put it down yet. <laughs> In a lot of productions, this is where they have that classic pantomime sequence, which is sort of um, a sign language method for ballet. This is where Odette introduces herself as the Queen of the Swans and tells Siegfried about her tragic story and about the curse that Rothbard has brought upon her. And what she tells him is that there is a way for the curse to be broken, and that is if a prince who has never loved before will swear his eternal fidelity to her, she she and all the other swan maidens will be completely set free. But the catch is that if he proves to be false, and if he betrays her, then she and all the swans will be doomed forever to remain as swans. After this is where the rest of the swan maidens come in. This is one of the most famous and one of the most challenging pieces of corps de ballet work in the history of ballet. So corps de ballet translated is the body of the ballet. And some productions have 30 and some productions have as many as 60 women come out to be the swan maidens in their white tutus and feather headpieces. And they all dance together in perfect synchronicity. After this, we have the white swan pas de deux, which is definitely the most beautiful part of the whole ballet for the choreography and storytelling, but also for the music. As far as the music goes, Tchaikovsky didn't actually get a lot of instruction on what the music was supposed to sound like. So Rycenter only gave him information as far as what tempo he wanted it to be at, so what speed, and also what time signature, so if it's counted in a 4 or a 3 or whatnot. All of this music is mostly of Tchaikovsky's own genius. He really composed yeah. it from the ground up. He didn't have much to work with. And the music for the White Swan Parada is really special because you can hear so plainly the sorrow of Odette and all the swan maidens, but at the same time you can hear the sweetness of hope that they might have a chance of being saved. You can hear that through the melody and you can hear that through the build of the pas de In the pas de deux, we can really see Odette's internal dilemma. She's trying to love her prince and she's longing so much to be free. But her swanish tendencies keep bringing her back to that timidity and she finds herself shying away from him and withdrawing from him. But it's Siegfried's persistence that eventually wins Odette over. There's this really beautiful moment in the pas de deux where she does begin to pull away but then she comes back to him on her own terms and that's the moment where she really gives way to fully to trust him and begins to really hope that she and this one maidens really can be free. You can really see the corps de ballet framing the couple on either side and there's this mix of hope but also caution because you realize that the fate of them all is in Odette's hands. If she picks the wrong prince or she isn't careful and the wrong prince swears to her falsely, it's not the prince that suffers, it's Odette and it's all of them. So they realize the gravity of what's happening. You can see them circling the couple, watching and waiting and hoping that she made the right choice. That beautiful unity and seeing them advocate for her is what makes the white act so very special. I love watching Odette and the Swan. As a matter of fact, the dancers of old used to go down to the lake before Odette rehearsals to study the ways of the Swan and all the little mannerisms and nuances. As dawn is breaking, Siegfried finally swears his eternal love to Odette. But as he does so, Baron von Rothbart, who has been hiding and watching this whole time, emerges from his hiding place. Siegfried, in his 21-year-old vigor, takes up his crossbow and aims to shoot at Rothbart. But Odette pleads him not to and explains another term and condition of this curse. That if Rothbart is killed before the curse is broken, Odette and the Maidens will still be doomed forever. So Siegfried is forced to watch as Rothbart turns Odette and the other Maidens back into swans and draws them back out onto the lake. After a 15 minute intermission, we are now in Act 2, Scene 1 of Swan Lake. 
This is the royal ball that Siegfried's mother had forewarned him about. And as the curtain opens, we can see that everyone is very excited, except him. As the ball commences, the queen introduces Siegfried to the six princesses that she has selected from six kingdoms. We are really low on battery. Siegfried, as you can imagine, is not having any of this because he knows who he's already sworn to. To his mother's dismay, he tells her that he will not take any of the princesses. And at this moment, we have a bit of an interruption. A trumpet sounds, and an unexpected guest arrives. It's a very fine gentleman. This is Von Rothbart in disguise, and with him he's brought his daughter Odile, over whom he's cast another spell to make her appear as Odette. Siegfried is completely deceived and he truly believes that Odile is Odette who has come to him at the ball. Sometimes he even thinks that it's Odette in masquerade, that's why she's in black. Oh, that makes so much sense. Isn't that interesting? Whoa. Isn't that weird? I'm sure a lot of audiences are wondering, why does he fall for Odile? Because clearly, wrong tutu color. <laughs> Sometimes he's completely bewitched. Sometimes, yeah. As a matter of fact, the infamous and very iconic 32 Fuetes that Odile performs later in the scene is actually her casting the spell on everyone in the room to believe that she is Odette. The 32 Fuentes were first performed by a legendary ballerina, Perina Lignani, an Italian ballerina, and she was the very first to do those 32 Fuentes on point. Having done that, Lignani set this as the standard for every other Odile that would come after her, and we're still doing them today. Throughout the Black Swan Padida, there's some very interesting choreographic elements because Odile will often mimic the mannerisms of the white swan. As you can see, the gentle flapping and the, the same timid swan posture that Odette exhibited back in Act 1. Sort of the darkness disguising as light yeah, sort of situation. You can really differentiate between the voice of Odette versus the voice of Odile. Mm -hmm. Odette's sound was the oboe, whereas Odile's voice is on the violin at a very high register. It has the same sweetness, but in a very sharp way, mm -hmm. whereas Odette's was very soft and low. By the end of the scene, Siegfried is 100% confident that Odile is Odette. He takes Odile and brings her to the Queen Mother and presents her as his selected bride. The Queen is satisfied, but our very fine gentleman, Rothbard, is not. He comes up and he demands that if Siegfried is confident in his choice, he must swear an oath. Siegfried is confident at the time, and he lifts his hand and swears to Odile. At that moment, Odile shrieks with laughter, thunder crashes, and the very fine gentleman reveals himself to Siegfried as Rothbart, the sorcerer. He pulls back the curtain of the window, through which Siegfried can clearly see Odette hovering by the window, crying bitterly at his betrayal. Prince Siegfried is completely distraught. Everything he thought he knew was crumbled before his eyes, and he knows full well the punishment for his great mistake. The queen faints, and Siegfried, unable to handle his remorse, runs out of the palace as chaos breaks loose within. This is the final scene of the ballet, and we find ourselves back at the lakeside, where all the swan maidens have gathered to hear about this potential success of the ball. Mm -hmm. Odette does return, but she does not bear the good news that they had hoped. Instead, she cries to them as she tells them the tragic news of their doom. Shortly followed by her is Siegfried, who is desperately searching for Odette and pleading the swans for the forgiveness of his fatal mistake. Eventually, he finds Odette in the midst of the swans, and they dance a final time, during which Odette grants him forgiveness, even though his betrayal has doomed them all. Last to arrive on the scene is Rothbard. Welcome back, Rothbard. And he stands on his usual perch on the cliff and conjures a handsome storm on the enchanted lake. And here is the interesting part. The story can go in many directions. In some versions, a fight ensues and Siegfried fights Rothbart and kills him. And somehow that breaks the curse, even though the terms and conditions stated otherwise. Perhaps Rothbart made that term and condition to protect himself. Perhaps. We don't know. In some versions, which is probably most authentic to the original storyline, Siegfried and Odette both choose death and that is where they are reunited. There's another 
one version where Siegfried and Odette both agree to die together, but before they can go through with it, Rothbart is destroyed because their decision alone is enough to prove their love for each other and to break the curse. Regardless of how the story ends, watching Swan Lake is always a powerful and impactful- that's exactly the same word. <laughs> Regardless of how the story ends, watching Swan Lake is always a beautiful and powerful experience, and we highly recommend you all to find a Swan Lake in your area and to support your local ballet and to immerse yourself in this beautiful story. Comment below, have you watched a Swan Lake? How did yours end? My personal favorite is always a happy ending. Hopefully this video can help you to see it with fresh eyes and to notice things perhaps you didn't notice before. So go watch a Swan Lake. If you enjoy videos like these, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit the bell button. That'd be nice. Well, I think that's all from us for now. This is Ballet Rain signing off. Until the next video. Bye.